Welcome everyone to the third in our series of North Dakota Center for Nursing webinars. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. All lines are on mute. We will unmute the lines during the question and answer period. Um, and we will be posting this recording on our website and uh, link it through our newsletter. So I'd like to welcome everyone. Today we have a special guest. We have Dr. Stacy Fenning, who is the North Dakota Board of Nursing Executive Director. And she will be giving a webinar on the North Dakota Board of Nursing Scope of Practice and Delegation. So take it away, Stacy. Thank you. And I would like to introduce Pat Hill as well. And Pat has been our Assistant Director for Practice and Discipline for many years here at the Board. And she's going to be joining today in the presentation and also be assisting with question and answers at the end. She has a, a vast amount of knowledge and history, with, especially with delegation. So I think this will be a, um, a great opportunity for the for the attendees to hear what we have regarding the scope of practice and delegation. So to start with, I still have people joining in, so I, I see I just need to jo let them join when it gets to that point. So, um, so to start with, North Dakota Board of Nursing Overview is going to be an important part of understanding delegation, as well as the scope of practice. So we'll look at the mission and the Nurse Practice Act and the Administrative Code here at with the State Board of Nursing and some important definitions. We'll also look at scope of practice and the related definitions and laws and rules because scope of practice really is a foundation to delegation. And scope of practice decision-making framework, which is hot off the press from National Council, which came out in, 2000, in October of 2016. And this decision frame, this decision-making framework will assist us with knowing or allowing us to kind of investigate what scope of practice looks like and if there's any practice questions that come up regarding scope. And then we'll look at delegating and assigning and the definitions related and the parameters per law and rules and also some important ANA and National Council publications that assist nursing across the nation with this delegation um, task. So a North Dakota Board of Nursing Overview, uh, currently the North Dakota Board of Nursing licensed 14,664 RNs, 3,729 LPNs, and 1,333 APRNs with, 800, or with 904 prescriptive authority license. And this number goes up each time I update this PowerPoint. So it's really interesting to see that um, even though in the face of a sh nursing shortage, we do see these numbers increasing very frequently. There are eight staff members to carry out the operations of the board. We have four directors and four administrative staff. The board is U.S. Department of Education um, approved to uh, recognize to approve education programs, and currently there are 18 programs in the state. North Dakota is one of 25 states in the, the Nurse Licensure Compact, and we also have investigations, and we have completed an average of 50, which are completed in the average of 50 days from receipt of the allegations. And in regards to complaints, and this is helpful to know too because we have anything that has to do with scope of practice or delegation does come to the board. And the board receives 143 complaints or allegations related to licensees and have brought 150 discipline cases to resolution in 2016. All board disciplinary actions are placed on nurses and on the website so, um, so that it's open to the public. And some emerging trends that um, I'd like to just mention as we move forward with our Board of Nursing Overview is that the national transition from the Nurse License Compact to an Enhanced Nurse License Compact is occurring, and North Dakota has been part of a compact for, since 2004, and there are 10 states that have enacted the new compact, and there are about 20 states moving forward in 2017, including North Dakota. And it's very much a language cleanup for those who are already in the compact. And there's also an Advanced Practice Compact, which will be um, seeing come forward in 2017 here in North Dakota as well. And so the mission of the board is to assure North Dakota citizens quality nursing care through the regulation of standard nursing education, licensure, and practice. Um, by law, the mission of North Dakota is to protect the public, and typical duties of the board do include enforcing the Practice Act and nurse licensure. And when you look at the board composition, we have uh, four-year terms, which are appointed by the governor. We have one APRN board member, five RN board members, two LPN, and one public member. And the nurses must be actually engaged in practice to be on the board. This is a current list of our board members. And as you can see, we have a, a good diverse geographical population as far as and diversity is one of the things we always want to look at for board composition. So we have members from 
Velva, Bismarck, Minot, Grand Forks, um, Catherine, North Dakota. And so to start out looking at laws and rules, and this is really the foundation of practice, any licensee who holds the North Dakota nursing license is it imposes it imposes individual accountability. So the accountability of the individual nurse is really to be following the law and rules. We have the North Dakota Century Code, and uh, this PowerPoint, I would be happy to share the PowerPoint because you can click on the, these darkened, the black um, actual the Century Code and the North Dakota Administrative Code, and you'll be able to go right to the site to look at those. So each state or territory has what's called the Nurse Practice Act, which is enforced in each board. And it really focuses on the qualifications of licensees, the nursing title that's allowed to be used, and that's looking at APRN, RN, LPN, and scope of practice, what the nurses are allowed to do, and actions that can or will happen if the nurse does not follow the nursing law. And that's where we get into the discipline. And so when you look at the um, century code is actually the, the backbone of, the, of what we follow as licensees. And the North Dakota Administrative Code is really the flesh that goes onto the bone. So it really helps us enforce what's happening with the Nurse Practice Act. Everything is tied to the Nurse Practice Act that we do in our practice. And so this is, some, these, this is really the foundation of the Nurse Practice Act. It includes scope and exceptions. There's definitions that are important to the, what's going to be discussed in the Practice Act. There's license requirements, board composition and qualifications. Then it sets forth the law for initial licensure, the criminal history check, renewal and reactivation, duties of licensees. That's one of the areas we'll be looking at closely today because that has to do with the delegation as well as scope of practice. And emergency treatment by a nurse is also included in disciplinary proceedings and grounds for discipline. And then there's delegation of medication administration, supervision and delegation of nursing interventions, and nursing education programs. So as you can see, the Nurse Practice Act does very much look at delegation as far as a nursing function. The duties of the board is to regulate practice of nursing as provided in this chapter by adopting and enforcing the administrative rules. And again, those are the, the rules are separate, but they, are, they give a lot of substance to the Nurse Practice Act. And they also have the board, the board shall adopt and enforce rules to, for the nursing practice. And then initial licensure and registration, the board shall adopt and enforce administrative rules establishing qualifications for initial licensure. And then it gets into the general administration, nurse licensure standards of education programs, student loans, and then nursing practice. And standards of practice includes the role, the standard of professional accountability, scope of practice and responsibilities. And the APRN one includes licensure and prescriptive authority, which is unique. And then there's also there's also uh, information on the unlicensed assistive person. So some important definitions as we get started. A nurse is an individual who is currently licensed as an advanced practice registered nurse, specialty practice registered nurse, registered nurse, or licensed practical nurse. So just to make that good and clear, that's what we refer to when, we, when it's talking about nurse throughout the chapter. And nursing is the performance of an act utilizing specialized knowledge skills and abilities for clients in a variety of settings. And there are five functions of the nurse that's outlined, which is to maintain health and prevention of illness, to assess and diagnose human responses to actual or potential health problems, providing support and restorative care and nursing treatments, medication administration, health counseling and teaching, and also administration, teaching, supervising, delegating is listed here as a nursing act and evaluation of health and nursing practices, and to collaborate with other professionals. So there's a lot that's encompassed in nursing, and it is varied between the different levels of nursing that are outlined within, within the North Dakota Administrative Code. So here's some definitions on the licensed practical nurse. And what's unique about the licensed practical nurse is that, it, that the practice is dependent under the supervision of an RN, APRN or SPRN and a licensed or a licensed practitioner. And a licensed practitioner includes uh, physicians and other other. There's actually a definition for that, which I should have probably included. But that is really those that are prescribers. It seems to be a general trend for the licensed practitioner. So that the LPN has a unique is unique in that it's a dependent function. And then the registered nurse practices nursing independently or interdependently through application of nursing process. And the advanced practice nurse holds the current licensure. And there's roles that are listed here, the certified nurse practitioner, 
the certified registered nurse anesthetist, the nurse midwife, and also the clinical nurse specialist, and the functions in one of the population foci as approved by the board. And then we have our unlicensed assistive persons who are assistants to the nurse, regardless of title, authorized to perform nursing interventions delegated and supervised by the nurse. And so that's very important to look at those words. Uh, the super, it's delegated and supervised. Medication assistance threes, surgical, text dialysis, text, and medical assistance are the main UAPs that we see here at the board. And so now we'll get into scope of practice. And scope of practice definition, these are important to really understand the scope of practice. So our Nurse Practice Act states, scope is the practice of nursing is continually evolving and responding to changes within healthcare patterns and systems. There are overlapping functions within the practice of nursing and other providers of healthcare. So that's a statement in the Nurse Practice Act. And in our rules of the administrative code, we have scope of practice as the delineation of the nature and extent of practice. So it's really how, how each level of nursing is able to practice and there's a chapter for each of, each of them. There's an LPN chapter, a RN chapter, and an APRN chapter. Authority is legal authority to provide nursing care granted through licensure as nurse or through delegation of nursing intervention from the licensed nurse. And competence is application and integration of the knowledge, skills, ability, judgment necessary to meet the standards. And competence comes up when you look at accountability for nurses to practice within their scope of practice. So each nurse is truly accountable for knowing their scope of practice and maintaining within that scope of practice. And when it comes to delegating, to be able to delegate to those and have the, the delegated tasks be in the scope of practice of the individual they're delegating or assigning. So accountability is to be answered, is to be answerable to oneself and others for one's own choices. Their decisions, actions as measured against the standards such as established by the Code of Ethics for, nurse, for Nurses with Interpretive Statement. And that came from the ANA, the interpretive statement that was published this year. And that is a, that's a very important definition to understand for those who are doing delegating because when you delegate tasks or assign tasks, it is still the accountability of that delegating professional to be accountable for the actions that occur. And provision for the ANA Code of Ethics interpretive statement, the nurse has authority, accountability, and responsibility for nursing practice and takes action consistent with obligation to help to promote health and to provide optimal care. And then if we look at the critical, this is for scope of practice, the critical focus is for determining scope of practice. Um, th this is really where scope of practice came from at a national level. It's a historical basis for profession and evolution of the practice. And so we do, see, we do see changes in the scope of practice through the years. And one change that we've seen was with the advanced practice nurses gaining their, gaining the, um, or repealing the collaborative agreement back in 2011. It changed their scope of practice to allow them to prescribe and to have their prescriptive authority without having a collaborative physician. So we do see these scope of practices evolve over the years. The important thing to remember is that you have to have the skills and knowledge and the training to back up your practice. So even though we have a scope of practice in law, it's, it's very important that you have that education and that you can, um, if you ever do come up for discipline, that you're able to back what you've done in your practice through your scope of practice and through what you have as education, any additional training that you've had, um, it's all very important to consider. So the other, another component is relationship of education and training to lic of licensees to scope of practice and that we just talked about. Evidence related to how scope of practice benefits the public. And so there's always a balance between scope, opening up scope of practice and maintaining safety. And if you have that education and training involved, it's a, it's a, you have better odds of maintaining that public safety, which is really what, what the board is intent to do. And then we have capacity and authorization of regulatory agencies to adopt and enforce the standards and scope of practice. And that's where the Board of Nursing comes in. So to focus in on the LPN scope of practice, they have a, the LPN has a dependent practice. It functions under the supervision, again, of the RN, the APRN, or the licensed practitioner. The LPN can assist and participate in implementing nursing process. Selected components in nursing management of IV therapy with specific training, and many of the, the programs in North Dakota have IV training. However, there are also IV certification courses that can be taken to allow LPNs to um, do this management of IV, IV therapy. And for scope, the, the LPN participates in nursing cares, 
conducts a focused nursing assessment and contributes to data for the care plan. The plan of care of a stable, predictable client, and I know that we have had that come up, um, and Pat can attest to that too, that wanting to know what a stable, predictable client is. And one of the things that is important to understand is it is a facility determination are those who know the patient to determine the stable and predictable nature of the client. And if and it, it, ultimate responsibility and accountability does lie on the administration and the and the nurses who are delegating to be sure that that client is is known to be stable or predictable. And we've had some calls to the board regarding that, and it really is a judgment call on behalf of the of the uh, institution and the nurse that's delegating. And so also to assist RN and licensed practitioners in identification of client needs and goals. And the LPN may assign or delegate performance of the nursing interventions to other persons, such as other LPNs or UAPs. And when it comes to delegating, delegating would be with the UAP, and assigning would be with the LPN, and we'll talk about that um, coming up. So with the RN scope of practice, here's some information on the RN scope of practice. Responsible and accountable to practice according to standards, provide care based on the needs, and have the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the RN and organization policy. Those are all um, part of the scope of practice. A nursing practice role is determined by application of nursing knowledge, not the setting or position. So that has come up recently as well, that it doesn't matter which setting the RN is in, the scope of practice is the same across the board also applies nursing process independently and interdependently and dependently. And then administration and management of nursing by RN includes assigning and delegation interventions that may be performed by others. So the RN utilizes nursing process to assess, diagnose, establish plan with outcome criteria, intervene, evaluate, document health problems in nursing practice. It includes teaching and communicating. And the important thing to understand with this statement is when we talk about diagnosing and evaluating and intervening, this is nursing diagnosis. And so when we move to the APRN scope of practice, the APRN looks at more of a comprehensive advanced assessment of, the, of health status based on interpretive data, analyze multiple resources of data and select appropriate treatment, and coordinate resources for provision of care, and to maintain accountability and responsibility for the quality of care provided. And that's within the APRN scope of practice. And also, the APRN scope of practice includes assessing clients and synthesizing data, so looking at diagnostics that are ordered and entering them into the, the nursing framework, identifying and developing plan and maintaining nursing care, and then this is unique for the advanced practice nurse to prescribe therapeutic regimen, diagnosing, prescribing, administering, dispensing legal drugs and controlled substances. And in 2011, we had the repeal of the collaborative agreement which brought North Dakota to the, be full, a full plenary state for advanced practice nursing. That means that our advanced practice nurses in North, North Dakota can practice to their full extent. And then also the APRN evaluates prescribed healthcare regimens for clients and can assign and delegate and teach and counsel, and again, manage, supervise, and evaluate, and also um, integrate the quality improvements. So when we get into decision-making framework as far as scope of practice. The National Council for State Board of Nursing has just released their updated decision-making framework, and the goal is to promote safety to patients, and it's a, st a standardized decision-making framework for all licensed nurses in all settings with respect to their education. And we've actually had the opportunity to use this a couple times here at the board, and it's a very uh, straightforward framework, and we'll kind of go through a couple scenarios before we move on to the actual delegation piece. Because scope of practice, again, it's, it's very important to understand scope of practice in order to be able to effectively delegate. And so the decision-making framework really um, allows individuals to be accountable for their practice decisions and to communicate with healthcare professionals regarding scope of practice and nurses' accountability. And accountability is another word we'll see quite a bit when we talk about delegation. And it also infor informs employers about scope of practice and nursing accountability. So this is a, a document and a framework that we will have we have on our website, and we also instruct facilities that call in question about scope of practice to look at this framework as well. And it, it is a guide for professional nursing organizations, credentialing and regulatory agencies in formulation of scope and standards of practice, policy, and position statements. And the board did adopt this new decision-making framework at the November 2016 meeting. 
And so the first start, and if you, I guess we, we can look at, there's a couple scenarios that have come to the board. Um, one of them is um, battlefield acupuncture. And the question was, is, is acupuncture or battlefield acupuncture within the LPN and RPN scope of practice? And so is the activity or intervention role prohibited by the Nurse Practice Act or rules or regulations or any other applicable laws or rules or regulations or accreditation standards or nursing professional scope and standards? So what we want to know with this first step is, is this practice within law or against the law? And so if this is, if you see that this is against the law, you stop, it stops right here. The decision framework stops right there. Um, if it's not against the law, you can move on to the next, um, the next question. And the other one that we have had come to the board is, is it within LPN scope of practice to give IV morphine when assigned by an RN? So those are two of the scenarios. So if we look at the, acufield, the battlefield acupuncture for LPN and RN scope of practice, when we looked at the North Dakota Century Code, there is a chapter for acupuncturists, and there is a section that states that license, talks about license requirement, and effective January 1, 2016, any, indiv any individual may not practice any form of acupuncture without a current acupuncture license ba issued by the board. So right there, it felt like a stop, because we have, we have a licensing body that does license acupuncture, and it's not within nursing scope of practice, and it's actually against the law in the in the uh, acupuncture century code. So to, so to that, that was a stop. Um, based on the restrictions of other boards, acupuncture is a discipline that requires licensure and specific education, and that specific education is not within the RN or LPN education model, and therefore it's not within the scope of practice for the R R and LPN to perform battlefield acupuncture. So that one stopped right there. Um, when we looked at the IV, the IV morphine that's given by an RN, that we found that the role of the licensed practical nurse in IV therapy, which is in our North Dakota Administrative Code, allows for this practice to occur. So that was a yes on that one. So we were able to move forward. And so the next section of this framework is is performing the activity intervention or role consistent with evidence-based nursing and healthcare literature. So then we get to kind of go to the literature and look. And as far as the LPN scope to give IV morphine when assigned by an RN, the ANA Code of Ethics, there were no barriers in LPNs administering medications. Both LPN and RN maintain acceptability for the intervention. The National Council Research Brief, Volume 66 in March 2016, there was a report that findings from 2015 LPN knowledge survey included IV and controlled substance nationally for LPNs. So really when we looked at the literature, we found about three documents in Nash through National Council and ANA that said yes, this is okay for LPNs to do, it's within standard of practice. So we were able to say yes to that one. And then the next part of the framework is, are there practice setting policies and procedures in place to support performing the activity, intervention, or role? And with this, the IV scope of practice for IV therapy, the facility is to use evidence and the Nurse Practice Act and Administrative Code to develop and maintain policies and procedures. So at this point of the framework, it really goes back to the hands of the facility and the RN or the LPN, those who are delegating or assigning, to be sure that there is proper policies and procedures in place to follow. And the next one is, has the nurse completed necessary education to safely perform the activity intervention role? And for this one too, um, the LPN must have certification or curriculum in the program which follows the Board of Nursing Guidelines for IV. And if this is true, if the, if the LPN has had the IV certification, then this would be a yes and be able to progress to the next. And then we have, is there documented evidence of nurses' current competence? to safely perform the activity and intervention. So this is really up to the facility to, to develop those competency checkoffs or lab skills and to be able to have that in the file for the LPN so that they are shown that they are competent in doing this procedure. So again, if anything would happen, it would come, to, come as far as either discipline or litigation, the LPN and the facility would have documentation that this was, there was training and competency regarding this procedure. And then we have the next step, does the nurse have appropriate resources to perform the activity, the intervention, and the role in the setting? And that's very much facility specific. So the facility will want to ensure that the LPN has everything that is needed to perform this function. 
And then the last, well, I guess we have two more. The next one is, would a reasonable and prudent nurse perform the activity, intervention, or role in the setting? And again, um, this is judgment-based. This would be a yes, as it is within scope of practice, and there would be facility policies at this time and competencies. And then this is the final one. Is the nurse prepared to accept accountability for the activity, intervention, role, or related outcomes? And this is very much judgment-based, dependent on the nurse. So the nurse, the LPN and the RN, the advanced practice nurse, when they, when they do delegation or assigning and when they do tasks on their own, they need to be able to accept that accountability for any outcomes. And so with safe and effective healthcare for citizens, it's the heart of the scope of practice of law and rules, which aim to ensure public protection and assure that the licensee is competent to provide the care. Nursing practice is continually evolving to meet needs of healthcare and healthcare systems, and must promote competent professionals while supporting access to care and accept inevitable overlapping of scopes. So that really wraps up our scope of practice discussion. And now we're gonna move into the delegation. So hopefully there's a, enough background information that you have on the Nurse Practice Act and the North Dakota Administrative Code and the scope of practice of each individual licensee to now move into delegation. And so here's some important definitions that go along with delegation. We have um, delegation itself is the authorization for performance of selected nursing interventions and cares from a licensed nurse to a UAP. Now this is very specific that it is from a licensed nurse to a registered unlicensed personnel. And then assigning is the term used for a licensed nurse delegating or designating responsibility for performance of a nursing intervention to another licensed nurse. So an RN to an LPN or an advanced practice to an RN or an RN to or an RN to an RN or an LPN to an LPN. I mean, anyway, it's, you, we can delegate or assign amongst the licensees. And then nursing intervention is the initiation and completion of client-focused actions necessary to accomplish goals defined in the plan of care. And that includes ADLs. And there's different, there's different kinds of assessments when we hear the word assessment brought up um, that we can talk about. We have, we have focused assessments which are more in line with the licensed practical nurse scope of practice. There's comprehensive assessments which the registered nurse can do, and then there's advanced assessments which are specific to advanced practice registered nurses. So some more definitions that we have. Um, supervision is maintaining accountability to determine whether or not nursing care is inadequate or is adequate <laughs> and delivered appropriately. So supervision is a key component to delegation, and we'll, we'll talk about that some more, but really maintaining that accountability is part of supervision. It includes assessment and evaluation of the client's condition and response to the nursing care, and evaluation of competence of the person providing the care. And then direction is the provision of written or verbal guidance and supervision by a licensed nurse who is responsible to manage the provision of nursing interventions by another person. So direction should be very clear, and it's, it's something that gives that person that is being assigned or delegated the, the good instruction or the appropriate instruction on how to do what they need to do or what they're delegated to do. Um, stable, we had talked about that a little bit ago. What is a stable client? So it is a situation in which clients' clinical and behavioral status or needs are determined by the RN and LPN to be predictable. So again, there it is determined by those licensees. It should be, non, it should be predictable, non-fluctuating, and consistent or in which fluctuations are expected and interventions are planned. So that's another component. So if we expect there may be some fluctuations, let's just make sure we have a plan in place. And so um, we, I think it's understood that predictable is a, a, a difficult world, word because I don't know that I would say anything is predictable, but we just really need to use our judgment on, you know, if this patient would be deemed to be consistent and um, if there is something that can come up to have a plan for that. And so moving on then to the Nurse Practice Act for delegation in the Nurse Practice. The Nurse Practice Act actually has two components. Um, they state that, uh, it states that a licensed nurse may delegate medication administration to a person ex exempt under subsection 9 and 13 of section 43-12.1-04. So this really refers us to the medication administration. And then a nurse may supervise and delegate nursing interventions to an individual ex exempt under this section 13, which refers to the unlicensed assistive person. And then the North Dakota Administrative Code has standards for practice for LPN, and that 
the 54-05-01-07 is administration and management of nursing by LPN includes assigning and delegating nursing interventions. So delegation is, is important enough to actually be a, a part of the North Dakota Administrative Code. UAPs complement licensed nurses in performing of nursing interventions but may not substitute the licensed nurse. So that's important to understand as well. And then 54-05-01-09, in maintaining accountability for delegation, the LPN shall assign nursing care within the LPN scope of practice to other LPNs, monitor and evaluate the cares assigned to the other LPN. So we see some key components coming out, the, the actual monitoring and evaluating of the, and maintaining accountability are kind of themes that we see co continually come about. Um, so also to, to delegate to another only those cares that that person has necessary skills or competencies to accomplish. So we want to be sure that if we delegate to a UAP that that UAP has had training and, and is competent in doing those cares. And delegation must pose minimal risk. When delegating the LPN shall ensure the UAP is on the registry, has education and demonstrated competency for the intervention, ensure the results of the care are reasonably predictable, Ensure interventions does not require assessment. Assessment cannot be delegated. So ensuring that the intervention does not require assessment, interpretation, or independent decision making. And that is really key. Um, from what we've seen come to the board as far as concerns, um, this is one of the areas that we see um, errors made. So that's a really important one to look at. Also to provide clear directions and within facility policy. And truly delegations should start at the administrative or facility level. In the, in the form of policies and procedures and then training for those that are those UAPs. And then to provide supervision and feedback to observe, evaluate, communicate outcomes. So this is definitely a team effort if you take a look at the need for supervising and monitoring and evaluating, that's, that's a team effort. It's not something you can um, give, you can, a task you can give away and, and not be, and just have it, your hands free of it. It's really something you need to continually evaluate. And so when we look at the RN standards, uh, the North Dakota Administrative Code, there is administration and management of nursing by RNs includes assigning and delegating nursing interventions. So again, th again this has its own standard um, and also it's similar to the LPN, but the RN can assign and delegate responsibility for performance of nursing intervention to others. And assigning of interventions may be made by RNs to other authorized to provide nursing care. So RN can delegate to LPN and also delegate to the UAPs. So there's a section for RN administrator that is important to look at too because a lot of times delegation or assigning comes from the administrator level. So the administrator shall select nursing service delivery models for provisions of care, assess health status of the client group, so they're looking at the group of, as a whole, analyze data, identify collective nursing care needs, priorities, and necessary resources, and that's really where delegation comes in at the administrative level to make sure that there's policies in place, that the resources are there that are needed, and also the support that's needed. And reasonable to determine, responsible, I'm sorry, it's responsible to determine nurse has the required competencies expected for the practice role, and identify nursing personnel by position, title, description, qualifications, and that's important too with delegation that, it's in, that it is in your job description and qualifications and to ensure that the UAPs are in, on the registry and have education and demonstrated competencies. And so when we look at the advanced practice standard, there is, there is a section on assigning and delegating nursing interventions that may be performed by others, and otherwise it's very similar to the other two chapters. Okay, so moving on, um, when we talk about delegation, Delegation and assigning is an essential nursing skill, and we see that through the multiple documents available nationally and also in our own North Dakota Nurse Practices Act and also the North Dakota Administrative Code that delegation is a key part of practice. When done safely and effectively, so that's a very important thing. We want to maintain that safety and, and efficiency in doing the, with the delegation. The licensed nurse maintains full responsibility and accountability for tasks delegated. So why delegate? Um, certainly we have more work than we have nurses, and with, with um, the perceived nursing shortage, and I call it that because it, it's certainly a, a, a feeling that we have throughout the state and the nation that we have a shortage of nursing. There's a larger demand on nurses, and we have less nurses, or we have more vacancies right now than we've ever had. So um, with that, delegation and assigning becomes essential. 
And also with the increasing complexity of our healthcare therapies and delivery, if we look at the model of healthcare from 20 years ago to today, uh, the changes have been, have been just revolutionary. And with that, they have also become more complex. So again, delegating and assigning becomes essential. Um, who can delegate or assign? And I have that listed there, the APRN, RN, and LPN can delegate to a UAP. And any other delegation among the licensed persons is, also, is called assigning. So here we have the different levels of delegation. So we start out we start out with the assessment, and then there's level two, which is the actual delegation, and level three is the monitoring, and level four is the evaluation. Monitoring is the third step in the delegation process and, and the one that frequently causes the problems. Um, we really have to maintain accountability and supervise and monitor as as laid out in the Nurse Practice Act and the Administrative Code. If checkpoints have not been prearranged, it's easy for delegated nurses and the assistants to get busy and forget to check in. So that's just an area we need to focus our attention to. And then, so if you look at assessment is really the nurse determines if an intervention may be delegated or assigned. And then to delegate the appropriate, to the appropriate individual, it has to be a mutual agreement and there needs to be communication, direction, and expectations related to the task. When we look at the monitoring, it's the supervision, monitoring of the performance, intervening if needed, and communicating the task during the task. So supervision really means um, either direct or indirect, directly monitoring the process. And then four is the evaluation, which the nurse follows up where the cares where the cares met um, and allow for the feedback between the two and how how the task delegation went. And so when we look at some five assessment red flags, and this has been, I, this came from a PowerPoint from years ago, these assessment red flags have been pretty consistent over the years, but um, the, co how, the complex nursing intervention is a concern. Um, if the intervention is too complex, it may be difficult to safely delegate or assign. If there's an unidenti unidentified client need, another red flag is if there's lacking the, the required knowledge and skills of the those who are being assigned or delegated to, insufficient opportunity to train, and insufficient opportunity to monitor and supervise. So if any of those come up, those are definite red flags that something may go wrong with the task that's being delegated. And here are the five rights to delegating and assigning. You want to make sure you're assigning the right task. So consider scope of practice, job description, the laws and the administrative code, po any policies that may be within the facility, guidelines. Also, there's code of ethics to look at and specific the specific patient at that specific time. So when you're looking at the task, all of those need to be considered. And then is it the right circumstance, the right person? Look at direction and communication and supervision and, ele and evaluation. So the evaluation component is um, under, the right under the right supervision and evaluation, we have to have proper monitoring and be available and accessible to that individual that's carrying out the task. And there are two documents that I'd like to discuss. There's the National Guidelines for Nursing Delegation that came out in 2016. And that that is um two there were two expert panels that were funded by our national by a National Council grant that represented the education, research, and practice. It was a review of literature and key issues. And develop, they developed national guidelines to facilitate and standardize the nursing delegation. And the other document is the joint statement on delegation by ANA and National Council. And this looked a lot more at terminology and policy considerations and principles of decision making or delegation. And it also includes a decision tree. So I'm going to take us to that one. And this worked good last last time. Are you able to see Patricia the document? Yes. Okay, very good. So this is the, the delegation joint statement, and it goes into some of the terminology, and it's very similar to what we had already discussed um, with delegation. And it talks about policy consideration and principles of delegation, which we've covered already to this point. Um, communication must be a two-way process. That's I think that's just, you can't state it enough that communication within delegation and that monitoring component is essential. But I want to get us to the um, actual um, 
tree, a decision tree here. Okay, here we go. So this is the actual document. It's the um, a decision tree for delegation of nursing to nursing assistive personnel. And so step one is to look at are there laws and rules in place that support the delegation. And then this is similar to the, the scope of practice framework in that there's a yes or a no, and if it's a no, that would be a stop. So if not in the license licensed nurses scope of practice then cannot delegate to the UAP. So certainly if it's not in the, the, the nurses scope of practice, it's not going to be in the UAP scope of practice. So that's pretty much a known. Um, authority to, get, to delegate varies. The licensed nurse must check the jurisdiction, statutes, and regulations. And this is so true um, for those who practice in multiple states. Every state is so unique in their Nurse Practice Act and their administrative code. So it's really important for those nurses to get to know the the rules and law within the states that they are practicing because it varies quite a bit. And then if we look at the next one, if this is a yes, then is the task within the scope of the delegating nurse? And if it's no, it's do not delegate. And then next, if it's a yes, has there been assessment of the client and needs? And if no, then the, the licensed nurse must, must assess the client's need and proceed to, to consider delegation because assessment is a piece that cannot be delegated to UAPs. That is a nursing a nursing function. And next, is delegating nurse competent to make the delegation decisions? And if no, then do not delegate until you can provide and document additional education. So again, that, that individual who's taking on the task has to have the proper education and training. If it's a yes, then is the task consistent with the recommended criteria for delegation to a UAP? They call them a, a nurse assistant personnel, but it's the same. So they must meet all of the following criteria. Is it within the UAP range of functions? They frequently recurs in a daily care of a client. Is it something that frequently occurs? So it's not a new, a new function. Is it performed according to an established sequence of steps? And again, that's where administration, it becomes important that you have policies and training for these delegated tasks. Does it involve little or no modification of the client care situation? May it be performed with a predictable outcome and does not inherently involve ongoing assessment, interpretation, or decision making. And again, that's brought up even in, in our North Dakota Administrative Code that there cannot be assessment, inter interpretation, or decision making to the person being delegated to. So that task goes back to the nurse. And then the last one is does not endanger a client's life or well-being. And I think um, that is a judgment as well that the those who are delegating needs or assigning needs to look at. And if all these are met, then, it, then it's a yes, you can move forward. And does the nursing assistive personnel have the appropriate knowledge, skills, and abilities to accept the delegation? And again, this comes down to that training and the competency checkoffs. And does the ability of the UAP match the care needs of the client? And then if that's a yes, then we also look at the agency policies and procedures, are there protocols in place? And if that's a yes, then is the appropriate supervision available? And then again, we look at, um, is it a task with the busyness of how, how we are um, in our practices, just knowing that you're able to carry through with the supervision is very, it's vital. And some of that comes up in one of the cases we'll look at. Um, if it's not available, you should not delegate. And then if all those are a yes, then you get to proceed to delegation. And it does have a step two, which talks about communication that we won't go over today at this time, but you can certainly feel free to click on those links and find these documents and, and review them. They're very, I thought, I thought they were very helpful. So limits on delegation, we have a assessment, cannot be delegated. Nursing diagnosis and care goals belongs also to the nurse. Um, formulation of the plan of care and evaluation of effectiveness, any teaching or counseling, the triage or coordination of care, and medication administration, unless they're a medication assistant, and then receiving or transmitting orders. Those are things that, those are limits on delegation that are that are written out in the North Dakota Administrative Code. And again, here's a National Council guidelines. I thought this was helpful too, as far as delegation and working with others, and I have the website there, but it really brings public protection in the middle, and it, it talks about the delegatee responsibility, and the employer and nurse leader responsibility and the licensed nurse responsibility. So um, this is a really good uh, infogram to look at how delegation works with, throughout the whole facility. And again, if you look, um, the licensed nurse responsibilities that, that 
the accountability for delegation responsibilities is there again. So it's it's very it's a very it's very important to maintain that accountability. And there is some accountability also with the delegatee. So um, that's I think that's important to bring out. And here's that algorithm we just went through. And so with the increasing demands on the nursing workforce, assigning and delegating is in a team becomes a vital practice, and we've been able to show that. Um, continuous communication, value of all team members, and trust between the healthcare providers will provide a solid foundation for further developing this art and science. And so that's the summary of the delegation. And there is a scenario that I would like to just run through since we have a few more minutes. Um, this scenario was found in the ANA Code of Ethics. And I thought it was just a very good demonstration. If we look at provision four of the ANA Code of Ethics, it looks it states that a nurse has the authority, accountability, and responsibility for nursing practice, makes decision and takes action consistent with the obligation to promote health and provide optimal care. And so uh, here's a here's a just a scenario of a violation of provision four, which is fail failure to conform to ethical and quality standards. So we have Robert, who is an advanced practice nurse was the owner and delegating nurse of an assisted living facility. He was contracted to be a preceptor and to supervise four students in, his, in an RM program. There was a complaint filed with the Department of Health and an investigation into Robert's assisted living facility revealed that the students were unsupervised when performing nursing tasks. Each student stated that Robert was often absent from the facility and no other licensed personnel was, a, was present. The, student was reported, the students reported that the patients were found in wet diapers and soiled sheets. The students were instructed to give medication without supervision and were instructed not to sign the medication administration record. The Department of Health investigator was unable to find adequate documentation of the nursing care. The students were instructed to feed the residents outside outdated and spoiled meals. So Robert had an ethical duty to safeguard the patients from harm by providing proper supervision. The nurses must make a reasonable effort to assess individual competence when delegating selected nursing activities. The assessment includes the evaluation of the knowledge, skills, and experience of the individual to whom the care is assigned and delegated, the complexity of the task, and the nursing care needs of the patient. So the Board of Nursing reviewed Robert's violation and found it failed to conform to an ethical and quality standard of the profession, and it was a violation of the Nurse Practice Act. So the Board of Nursing charged Robert with delegation of nursing acts to an individual lacking the ability to perform and failure to, failure to properly supervise the nursing students and failure to provide instruction and failure to assess the skills or experience of the individual supervised and he had a suspension, an emergency suspension of, of his APR and license. So I think that's a very a profound um, it, it, and it makes sense as far as his failure in delegation. There was no accountability, no supervision. These um, nursing students were not prepared to not be supervised and to have these tasks delegated. So I thought that was a really good one to share. And I think at this point, I'd just like to open up to any any questions. And Pat, Pat Hill and I are here, and we'd be happy to um, have discussion or question at this time. All right. I'm going to stop the recording.